You're listening to Dad Devotionals with Dave Domzowski. Subscribe to our newsletter at daddevotionals.com slash subscribe. Dad loves people. This fascinated me for several reasons. First, he expresses interest in everyone, not just the VIPs. This interest is genuine and attested to by all who know him. Second, he cared about people and would give someone his bus money and walk home if he saw that it would meet a real need. Third, his relationships with people were natural. His graciousness and gentleness and compassion were from his heart and soul. Those words are of Dr. David C. Whitcomb, the son of Professor John C. Whitcomb. David is the author of Good and Faithful Servant, The Life and Times of Professor John C. Wickham. He's a professor of medicine, cell biology, and molecular physiology and human genetics at the University of Pittsburgh. And he joins us today to talk about his father's influence on his life and how we impact our kids. David, welcome to Dad Devotionals. It's so great to have you. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. So let's start with this. Uh, And I think folks would really get get a kick out of understanding this dynamic. Tell us about your relationship with your father. Uh, well, um, you know, every person has uh, their own story. <clears throat> and mine was a, a little bit uh, awkward one. Uh, my father <clears throat> is was a, a brilliant man. He died in uh, 2020 at age 95. Uh, he was a, a book person, loved reading, and uh, was... Um, trained at a a military academy where he learned a lot of discipline, got an early acceptance to Princeton University. Uh, That uh, education was interrupted with World War II, where he was gone for three years to fight the Nazis in Germany, as they called him the computer. He was a a guy with a field artillery unit, and he would sit at headquarters with maps and information and knew where all of the uh, howitzers were hidden and where the enemy was and would calculate, you know, the uh, trajectory of the bombs that uh, were used to uh, destroy the German tanks and, and army. So he did that. Then he uh, returned, finished Princeton University, uh, read a book uh, between when he returned from uh, uh, fighting, because he was a little bit disillusioned with everything. Some many people coming back from war just they're they're different sure and uh so he wasn't sure if he should return to uh princeton or not uh his spiritual father donald fullerton uh encouraged him to finish uh his work at princeton and then go to seminary because uh, my father had a passion to be a missionary to china uh so he did go back but uh before he returned to Princeton. He read a book by um, an author by the name of Wilbur Smith called Therefore Stand. And it was a plea for a new generation of apologists to come up and defend the Bible against uh, liberal thinking and higher criticism. So that just changed him into uh, an incredibly uh, proactive uh, Christian that worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week in evangelism on the Princeton campus and uh, with street meetings and uh, Sunday school classes and that kind of stuff. So he he was just 100% committed. He went to Grace Seminary uh, and trained to be a missionary, but the communists took over China and killed the Christians and expelled the missionaries, either dead or alive, and it was impossible for him to go there. So he was invited to stay on the faculty at Grace Seminary, and he was there for the next 30 years. Wow. Uh, during that time, I was born. Um, so uh, he, for his doctoral thesis, had written a, a, a thesis on the Genesis flood uh, from Genesis 6 uh, through 9. And uh, when I was young, I remember uh, it was published in 19... 19- Uh, 61, and I was six years old. So uh, he became internationally known at that time and was, uh, was very, you know, was very busy with uh, interviews and those types of things. Um, The second thing was that 
he was married while he was in, in a seminary uh, to my mother, and she uh, had four children. And then uh, about 1960, started getting very sick. She had an autoimmune disease mm -hmm. called uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, in which the immune system attacked the liver. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1970, she died. So my childhood memories of him were uh, of him being very busy as a seminary professor, uh, grading papers and being on, you know, the phone and conferences and uh, those types of things. But he would, uh, you know, take time to play with us as kids and do things that uh, especially like taking us uh, swimming and playing Frisbee. Those are the, the activities that we shared in common. So uh, those were my my early memories of him. And then there was, you know, there's a lot of little um, little things I remember that, uh, you know, pop into my head from time to time about uh, when I was growing up. So uh, I think that he was um, let, me, let me rephrase that. My mother uh, tried to protect his time and to provide a uh, a high view of him and his his uh, ministry sure. and uh, for us to try to help in that way. He also published these uh, large paper charts of the Hebrew kings mm -hmm. and mapped out the history of Israel, which wasn't really there before. And so seminary students and pastors had a hard time putting together uh, you know, the Old Testament books and the kings and the prophets and who did what. And so he mapped those out. So us kids got paid uh, to stuff these charts into envelopes. So we spent a lot of time helping that way. And then those were mailed out all over the world. So just a little bit of background about that, uh, uh, that type of thing. So that was the that was the best part. Yeah, no, no, I I love that. And I appreciate you taking us through and giving us a little bit of history about your dad and, and the fighting. I mean, good, good Lord. I mean, uh, talk about talk about service to our country and to the world. Uh, I did want to ask you about this. Uh, you mentioned in Good and Faithful Servant how your father didn't aspire to leadership positions. Um, why is that? And then how did he feel when God called him to do it anyway? You know, it's a that's a fascinating area. And um, my father and I are actually very different. Mm. Uh, I recently uh, listened to an audio book called Surrounded by Idiots. And it is a book uh, from an organizational development person that goes through the different personality types. Mm. And they're the ones that are similar to the Greek, you know, the uh, phlegmon and the caloric and uh, those those types. Sure. Uh, he calls them uh, red, yellow, green, and blue. Uh, red is the alpha male. Uh, they are uh, very goal oriented, long range plans, you know, just th that kind of a thing. Sure. Uh, yellows are more uh, Facebook oriented and they have friends everywhere and they're disorganized or the life of the party. They just are very, you know, friendly and, and, and uh, people, people but uh, a little bit disorganized. Uh, the green is uh, people who are, uh, the majority of people, they have their small circle of friends, they want to do their job and stay out of trouble and you know live their life and that kind of thing. So they don't really volunteer to do much. They're more, um, uh, you know, just uh, with their close circle of friends. Sure. Uh, and then the blue is the more engineering type. They're extremely interested in all the details to the, you know, the fifth degree, uh, very organized, very intelligent. They're not so goal oriented. Uh, they're more interested in the process than the destination. And it's important from an organizational standpoint because uh, this organization, um, the quote for, for the from the book, uh, Surrounded by Idiots, uh, the, the, the uh, CEO was all red with no other personality traits and his team were all blue. They were very smart engineers, but they really didn't care about getting a product out. And he was just so frustrated because he just wanted to crank these things out and they were just deep in the, 
in the weeds and enjoying right. it. And he just complained, you know, my problem is I'm surrounded by idiots. So uh, what I learned is that I am very red and my father is very blue. Mm, and so he's an analyst. Uh, he is very organized. Uh, he loves the details. Uh, he does have some long-term goals and, and uh, was able to, you know, complete things on time. But uh, he was more of a servant. He didn't want to take the responsibility. He didn't want to determine what the goals were and really look to others uh, for uh, guidance. But he was very careful to choose uh, people to follow that he, they had high integrity, that were accomplished, that were um, uh, really going in the same direction as him. And he actually uh, identified four people in his life that he called his forefathers uh, because he had a father-son relationship with his biological father mm -hmm. who really taught him my my grandfather was a was a high-ranking military officer and so it was about you know honor and country and and uh, respect and those types of things uh, then Donald Fullerton who he met at um, Princeton had was a retired missionary and that that man led him to the Lord and really mentored him and put a lot of time and energy into really mentoring him. That was his spiritual father. Mm -hmm. When he went to Grace Theological Seminary, he developed a relationship with Alva J. McLean, who was the founder of Grace Seminary. And my father was single uh, through a seminary and actually married after he joined the faculty. But uh, McLean took an interest in him and would have him over uh, for supper and then sit and talk and my father would grade papers with him and they would discuss things and so they had a very close relationship and my father had great respect for him <clears throat> and then the fourth person was uh, um, Henry Morris who was uh, a devout Christian and evangelist working with the Gideons but his career was as an engineer especially in hydrodynamics and uh, flood geology and my father uh, looked to him as more of his scientific father even though uh, he had been trained at Princeton in evolutionary geology and by the army in engineering with physics trajectory and how to blow up tanks so um, he he uh, looked to these men for guidance for uh, insights for um, how to do things in a, in the right way how to think about things approaching problems and uh, then wanted to work very hard to to please them and uh, to show that he had appreciated their advice and had taken it and that it was successful. And so th those uh, those uh, relationships were very important. The problem is, is that um, the uh, the fathers get old and die. Mm. And he found that uh, he was looked up to as being in a leadership position. But, um, you know, leadership has different elements to it. Um, they wanted him to be president of Grace Theological Seminary, and he said no. And the reason is, is that, uh, you know, the, the president of a university, their job is fundraising, facilities management, hiring, firing staff, uh, you know, trying to listen to, you know, the supporters' complaints, uh, doing some teaching, but uh, most of it is just uh, taking care of the facilities and making sure that the funding comes in and that the curriculum is okay and that, you know, you hire good people and fire bad ones and, and uh, those types of things. And he, that wasn't him. He just, he just was not interested in the facilities or money or those, those types of things because he was focused on uh, the future in heaven and God's plan on earth. So uh, he preferred to uh, to focus on teaching and preaching and and uh, those types of things. So uh, that one type of leadership, which is an administrative leader, mm -hmm. is very important. You have to have them. Uh, my father could probably never fire anybody. He knew they needed to be fired, but he couldn't pull the trigger. He just <laughs> You know, just thinking of him uh, during World War II, um, 
he had a technical job of aiming uh, howitzers at an enemy, but didn't actually see what happened when the bombs landed mm -hmm. until yeah. days later. Yeah. But um, uh, during his training, I remember, you know, they talked about, you know, you had to shoot a, learn how to clean and shoot a rifle and crawl underneath barbed wire. And uh, then they had a day where they taught knife fighting. And I just thought, I cannot imagine my father knife fighting and plunging a knife into another person oh, man. and killing them. I just, yeah. he, he, I just, uh, it was unimaginable. And, uh, you know, in war, there's things that you just, you're put into a position where, you know, it's uh, me or thee. And uh, I think he would have said, well, you know, um, I'm not going to fight just, you know, <laughs> It's just a strange thing. So uh, from a leadership standpoint, uh, he was a different type of leader. He led by example. He was a servant leader. Mm -hmm. He demonstrated how to study and apply the Bible. He demonstrated uh, how to apply God's word. He demonstrated how to witness uh, everywhere he went. And and his students were, were, in, were amazed. They used to run him to the airport. Uh, when he had to catch an airplane and every time they'd stop at a toll booth or at a, you know, the parking lot or something, he'd hand out a track and he would give people he'd witness to everybody. And that really made a big impression on them. And they remembered it throughout their, their uh, careers as uh, missionaries and pastors and others that, you know, take, take the most, make the most of every opportunity. Amen. You know, what I, my main takeaway from that is you can lead in whatever the way God calls you to lead. I mean, he gives you a personality for a reason. You, you, your father, you know, you, you both had different personalities, but you're both leading in the way that our Lord, in the way he made you. And that's what I, I want to encourage all the dads listening. I mean, God is putting you in the situation you're in for a reason. You are called to lead no matter what. You're called to lead your family. Even if that's your only role, you're still called to be a leader. You need to use the gifts that God gave you uh, and use them to the to their fullest extent. And don't be afraid to. Don't be afraid to embrace your personality, because you know father son very different, going about it in different ways. But they're still utilizing the talents. That's the key. Utilizing the talents. I mean, you talk about your father uh, from you know that engineering mindset. But then you think about it. It makes sense if he goes and puts together the entire list of of uh, kings and prophets and everything and. And, uh, and, and taking that, what many would probably find painstaking if you're, a you know, of the yellow personality, for instance, and, uh, but he did it. And then he went out and he still, you know, it, maybe he felt may usually to, to, to kind of hide behind it, but no, he wanted to share it. He wanted to share it with the world. He wanted to be out there and, uh, and, and declaring God, God, God's, um, God's word. And I, you know, I, I just want to encourage you dads to, to take that to heart. Don't be afraid to. And I think, reading, you know, a good and faithful servant will kind of give you the stories and the context to, um, to understand not just, not just David, not just John, but also you'll probably glean a little bit of knowledge for how God wants you to work in, uh, in any given situation in your life. So I just wanted to share that. And I want to thank you, uh, um, uh, Dr. Whitcomb for sharing that with us. Right now, we're going to take a break to thank our sponsors. When we come back, We'll chat more with Dr. David Whitcomb, medical doctor and professor and author of A Good and Faithful Servant. We'll be right back, folks. Dad, do you need a website for your ministry or business? American Web Creations is a web design and digital marketing specialist that helps small business owners grow their business. Whether it's building a new website, helping to get found on search engines, or simply managing all the moving parts of the digital world. American Web Creations makes it easy by handling everything in one place. If you're a swamped business owner and need a little digital relief, go to daddevotionals.com slash web for discounted pricing. That's daddevotionals.com slash web. Go there now. All right, we're back with Dr. Whitcomb, author of the book, Good and Faithful Servant, The Life and Times of Professor John Whitcomb. David, tell us this. Tell us about the biggest lesson that you learned from your dad and how you're still applying it today. I think the 
greatest lesson I learned is his approach to people in general. He was not, uh, I think he would have been happy in life as a loner, um, but, uh, you know, he wasn't uh, somebody who always had to be around friends. And I'm not sure that he had more than one or two close friends in his life. He had a lot of acquaintances and people he was friendly with. But I was always impressed when he was at a conference or a church or wherever he would be. There would be some, you know, uh, old lady, or old, it was old to me at that time, uh, probably middle-aged lady, come up to him and ask him a really kind of simple, simplistic question. I thought that's, that's kind of a dumb question. And my father would listen to her, ask her a little bit about herself, and then explain um, the answer to her in simple terms, made sure she understand it and that type of thing. And I just, I, you know, I remember once I said to dad, I said, boy, that was kind of a dumb question that woman asked you. <clears throat> and um, I said, I think you probably could have answered it much quicker. I said, why was it that you spent so much time uh, with her? And he said, this is one of God's children. Uh, this is a, a believer and one of God's children. And he saw everyone from, from that elevated standpoint. Uh, and so he was genuinely uh, humble and gracious um, for the sake of Christ. And he saw people from that perspective. And I just always was impressed how he had true humility based on the fact that he knew how great God was and what he had done for all believers and that out of many people he was chosen to be a representative of of God and to help God's people and and that really stuck with me because yeah. you know in the in the circles that I work with and the places I've been, you know, I've run across a lot of, you know, famous people and stuff like that. And they're arrogant, they're rude, they're demanding, they're, uh, they think they're all that. And um, it is embarrassing and off-putting uh, to me because I have a, a perfect model of what uh, humility and grace really is, not from a fakey standpoint, but from, you know, from that standpoint. Yeah, and absolutely. He, um, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's who he was. People often asked me, and I mean, often I'd hear this repeatedly. Your dad is so gracious and humble. What is he like in private? What is he like at home? And I always thought that was a weird question. I said, he's the same. That, that's who he is. You know, he's, he's uh, like you read at the beginning, you know, he was gracious and cared about other people and would take a loss to help somebody. Yeah. And without, without a thought, it was just, you know, that was just such a, a good example of what a Christian should be like. And so that's, that's really uh, helped me be, um, it was a great example for me to follow. Otherwise I would have been uh, probably a, a bad person. <laughs> no, that, that that's beautiful because so often we we go the other direction and we we're sitting in the crowd and maybe we're thinking that answer is kind of stupid too or that or that question is kind of stupid too. So I I, I understand that because we always make that quick judgment. Whereas your father, whether he it was innate in him or whether it was just something that God slowly taught him over time, uh, was to know no, we're all God's children. We're all we all deserve that dignity and that respect and to um be list be heard and be listened to you know something that came to mind when you were when you were speaking there is you you're you yourself are in a field where you know something something like this about about faith about christianity um i don't know how it was maybe in your father's time but especially nowadays is stands in contrast in many ways um it's it's something that is actively maybe even some of the folks that you said you encountered in who are more of the famous types that tend to be rude, that would be very dismissive of, of somebody like Professor John Whitcomb, especially today. Um, so this wasn't something I was going to ask, but it, I feel like God is 
wants me to ask this. How do you, how do you reconcile that? How do you, how do you um, still live out the faith despite the world, especially maybe even your industry saying that talk about stupid, that we think that's stupid. What, what would yeah. you say to those people? That's really a, a great question and an important question. Um, first of all, uh, what my father would always say is sanctify the Lord Christ in your heart. Hmm. And so put him number one. And because what you respond or how you re, you know respond to other people doesn't really matter when you get to heaven and God says, I gave you these opportunities and these tools and responsibilities. What did you do with it? Yes. And that's the only thing that matters. Yes. And so at work, you know, uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I ran the, was chief of division of gastroenterology, hepatology and nutrition at the University of Pittsburgh for 17 years. Wow. And, um, you know, during that time, I just was very straightforward. I said, you know, uh, we're going to have a division that is uh, uh, honest, moral, and respectful. And here's the student or the faculty handbook, which basically was the Ten Commandments. And <laughs> I said, this is what we're going to do. And I made it very clear, um, you know, that if you stay within the rules, you're fine. If you don't, you're fired. And um, then uh, was open about my faith and how I approach things and and that type of stuff. So, um when it comes to controversy, and my father, of course, was in a lot of controversies, because when you stand for the truth, you get attacked by everybody. Yes. And um, even within church things, there's, you know, the, the question is, is that how important is doctrine versus unity? Mm. And the answer to that is truth is the most precious thing and has to be uh, fought at, uh, fought for. Uh, if there is a difference of understanding, then you don't attack the person. You tell them, listen, if we are committed to honoring Christ and God wrote one book and it's internally consistent, let's sit down together and study it. And as we get to a deeper understanding of God's ways and his instructions, then we'll apply it together. And so he always held scripture as the final authority, recognizing that everybody has a history and a background and traditions and, you know, those types of things. Uh, some are good and some are bad and some are irrelevant unless, you know, you try to force them on other people. But he would just say, uh, you know, there's some difference of opinions. Let's study the Bible and see if we can come to a better, better understanding of what God said, and then we'll do it. Yeah. And so I really use that as well. You know, people would say, you know, um, how can you, um, how can you be a scientist and believe the Bible? Mm -hmm. And um, the answer is that as a Christian, I know science better than they do. I have a better insight into science. And people would often say to me in my research, how in the world did you figure that out? That was just an amazing insight. And the answer, of course, um, was that I have a completely different perspective than all of my, or than many of my colleagues. They believe that human beings are the result of multiple good mutations that changed a polywog into a person. And that mutations sort of accumulate in better and better ways and lead to where we are today. Well, my view is completely the opposite. I believe that God created humans in a perfect way and that all mutations are either neutral or damaging. Mm -hmm. And the genetic code codes for the pieces of biological machines and the machines have multiple parts that have to be in the right number in the right place at the right time and connect with each other and then run as a machine to have a function so the mutations may change the shape of the part or they may change the number of parts that you have for a complex system so that it has some dysfunction but amazingly each cell of the body also has 
a garbage collection system. And there are hundreds and hundreds of molecules whose job it is to go around and look for broken parts, grab them and pull them over to a recycling center and break them down into elements and rebuild the correct ones. And if the parts that pick up the garbage or, or defense against injury don't work, you're fine unless you have an injury. And then uh, those systems don't work. So that you end up with hundreds of different possibilities in each cell of each person. And if you try to just uh, use statistics to figure out you know, the one thing that's causing a problem, it's a failure. But if you use a reverse engineering approach, in other words, you say, okay, uh, how would a perfect machine work? And what happens if you add this uh, problem or that problem or whatever? Then you can run simulations of that, add in what the effects of mutations are in an individual person and predict exactly what's going to happen. Wow. And so that gives you incredible insight into dysfunction that nobody else has. And so I've had a very successful career. I've published over 400 papers and uh, co-authored 13 textbooks and um, one biography. Um, but I also started a biotech company called Ariel Precision Medicine that actually takes these principles, bypasses a very inefficient and expensive medical system and allows a physician and patient to get the right answer the first time using a uh, genetics that comes from a, a buckle swab or a saliva. And uh, you can get it, you can get the, the right answer immediately on your smartphone. So wow. bypass the whole system, get it right the first time. So uh, that's what I'm working on now. But that perspective, you know, I don't argue with people about evolution because if you don't believe in God, then you have no other alternative, even though it's a theory without a mechanism and it is absolutely failed in every area. Although people outside science don't realize that, they follow the science, even though they're completely ignorant as to how science works and uh, most of the uh, science that's pushed on them or pushed on them with uh, politicians or influencers uh, and and uh, not a rigorous and truthful scientific argument. Wow. So there you go. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Great, great soundbite material right there. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. You met you mentioned your your company and the and the, and the swab. So, what are you, I'm just I'm just curious for myself, and I'm sure some of the listeners will be too. What do you What are you looking to What are you looking to do there? I understand that you're you're bypassing some of the you know some of the systems and everything like that. But what do you What are you looking to do for folks? What What kind of answers are you looking to give them? Well, I mean, um, well, one that people may be familiar with is that. Um, as you get older, you start taking medicines for, you know, blood pressure and diabetes and uh, all kinds of things. It turns out that there are a lot of genetic mutations in the molecules that either take pro drugs and activate them into active drugs or take active drugs and metabolize them and remove them from your body. Mm -hmm. So if you have those uh, problems, then uh, you take a medicine and it doesn't work the way it's prescribed. And so it, it can be ineffective. Uh, sometimes it just doesn't work. Other times it can cause toxicity. Mm. Well, we know exactly why. We know the genetic mutations in each of the genes that metabolize each of the drugs. And so um, it would be helpful if you could get that information. So we take a buckle swab, we run, uh, this is pharmacogenetics, and then have it on a QR code on a wallet card or your smartphone. So you go to your pharmacist and say, here's my profile. Here are all the list of the drugs that I'm going to have a hard time metabolizing, should have a different dose. And, uh, you know, they can they can adjust it immediately. But the other thing is there's a bunch of symptoms. And I'm, I'm a gastroenterologist. So the first um, things are in gastroenterology. Um, if you go to a gastroenterologist and say, I've been having abdominal pain and bloating and some diarrhea and, you know, you get a, a upper endoscopy and a colonoscopy and some blood tests. And then they'll say, I have no idea what it is. If you try to pursue it, it's a diagnostic odyssey that takes 
a year or so, and they may never be able to figure out what's going on. So what we did is we took um, all of the uh, common disorders that caused that, went to their genetic basis, and put all of those onto the same QR code that you can scan. But this has a scan that the, the physician's phone will pick up, and uh, it can immediately sort through the things that are most likely and things that are unlikely, and then give uh, clinical decision support to say to the physician, uh, this person has a high risk of celiac disease, a low risk of pancreatic insu uh, exocrine insufficiency, a low risk of Crohn's disease, a low risk of uh, sucrase isomaltase deficiency, you know, and a, a low risk of uh, SIBO, and therefore you should get a transglutaminase test and put them on a special diet, and here are the resources you need. So in one second, you can get information that otherwise you won't get for a year after spending thousands of dollars and suffering the whole time. And so that's kind of what we do. That's that's incredible. Talk about, I mean, talk about picking up where where uh, this gentleman left off and really taking it and serving God's people. Thank you. That's 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 incredible. Um, My father just, has a I, fingerprint on this too, by the way. Uh, he was a Hebrew prof uh, Old Testament professor in Hebrew. Uh, the word Ariel is Hebrew for the lion of God, mm. and it represents an unstoppable force that's out to destroy evil. And so Ariel Precision Medicine um, has a mission, and uh, so that that's where it is. Wow, it sure does. Amen to that. Well, I, God God bless that endeavor for sure. Um, well, bringing it back, bringing it back to your father, as you, as you just did there. Can we um, let, let's get into a little bit about their mentors uh, for a minute. You know, we obviously you have and your father sure has. You both had tremendous careers, but, you know, we don't get there by ourselves. So take a minute. Talk to us about the importance of mentors and then we'll get to the lightning round. Please. All right. So um, as I mentioned, my father had four people he saw as mentors and um the mentoring relationship that he had with these four individuals was somewhat unique uh, because they were uh, fairly intense. They were interactive. They were prolonged. There were long um, uh, times uh, when he was in Princeton. Um, Donald Fullerton, who was a bachelor, uh, would you know, he would he would teach a uh, Bible study Sunday afternoon and then visit students and then come in, on several occasions to my father's dorm room and they would talk about the things of the Lord till midnight. And uh, Fullerton would would uh, call my father up and when he was available, he would take him out and uh, they would do missionary things together. He introduced him to Jack Wurtzen back when my father was. A, uh, you know, a, a college student and Wurtzen was already, you know, had a national uh, radio program and, and uh, got to know uh, Jack Wurtz and, and they were friends for life. And my father, after retiring from Grace Seminary, um, continued to teach at uh, Word of Life Bible Institute in New York and in Florida for years. And um, so those are the kinds of things that uh, those introductions, those uh, demonstrations to how to do things, take him out witnessing. Uh, Fullerton uh, encouraged my father when he graduated from college uh, to go to a retreat called Hesaba Heights, uh, where it was a Bible conference. My father worked as a grounds crewman, but my uh, but Fullerton came and introduced him to people and just poured his time and energy into my father, and my father responded by reading the books that were given to him, participating in discussions, coming to him with, with those types of things. Uh, the relationship with Alva J. McLean was very similar. Um, uh, my father was invited to his house for supper, and then afterwards they would just talk about different issues. And um, my um, uh, McLean felt that uh, it was important for the seminary professors to have a godly home and my father was raised up in a godless home. And so he helped uh, connect him with a Christian couple that really mentored him on what a Christian husband is 
and how to be a husband and a father uh, from a biblical perspective. And uh, my father, you know, I'm, I'm sure he learned a tremendous amount about that. Yeah. Uh, his relationship with his father was not great. Mm. Uh, my grandfather was, you know, a career oriented military person. He was like a man's man that, you know, was uh, loved uh, boxing matches and, and uh, survival stuff. And, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, fighting, I guess, if you're in the military, yeah. uh, but he loved that kind of stuff. My, my dad was a book person and they, you know, my grandfather would take him camping and he'd hate it. And, you know, he went, you know, pushed him through the boy scouts, which he did in sort of a perfunctory way, I believe. Uh, they finally uh, found golfing was an activity that both of them enjoyed. And that turned out to be the place where they could spend time together where um, neither one, I mean, both, both worlds overlapped and uh, that was a, that was the way that they, they were able to connect. And so my father had great respect for his father, but they were oil and water. Yeah. And, um, and I, I'm more like my grandfather than, than my father in personality, but um, that was important. Uh, my own uh, relationship with my father was um, strained at times for a couple reasons. Uh, the first one is that my father, you know, is, was a brilliant um, academic and a book person and editor and reader and just extremely good with uh, languages. And uh, I was a complete failure and I didn't really know why. It wasn't until I was an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh that I figured out what it was. I got a call from the chancellor's office and this lady there said, uh, she goes, David, uh, we would like for you to be on the board of directors for Providence School for Dyslexic Children. And I go, why are you calling me? She says, you're dyslexic. What? I said, what? What's that? And I, I looked it up and I, I'm going, I'm reading my life story. And it's a reading disability where you can't do language processing. So my reading is very slow. My spelling is atrocious. My handwriting is terrible. And I just, you know, I can't listen to a lecture and take notes. And so I, I did horrible in school. I was a discipline problem because I couldn't understand, you know, verbal instructions. Uh, in junior high school, I was uh, I was told by the counselors that I was not college material and that I should consider a career as a landscaper or a gardener. Um, I was pulled out of my regular classes and put in the MR classes, which is mentally retarded. Mm -hmm. And then I had a teacher by the name of Mr. Brenneman that said, uh, I'm not sure we're doing this right. I think David's bored because you can't be an idiot and a, one of our best chess players. So he put me in advanced uh, biology and advanced mathematics, and I did extremely well. And in retrospect, it's because they teach differently. They teach conceptually instead of memory. And for people that are dyslexic, those, those are really key things. And the second thing that happened when I was through halfway through college struggling with a C minus average at a low ranked college. Um, one cold night, I, uh, my hands were frozen from uh, trying to clean my windshield of ice with no gloves and no scraper. I'd use my pocket comb. Went back to the dorm and there were some guys drinking coffee and studying. And I picked up a cup of coffee to warm my hands and I ended up drinking it and it was pretty good. So I drank another cup went back to my dorm room, opened up my textbook. And for the first time in my life, I could read and understand what was on the pages. It was like a miracle. It was like the first time you put on glasses or, yeah. you know, just the, 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 the blinds were pulled apart and you can see out the window and there's a world out there. So I went from a, a C minus to a straight A student with coffee. There you go. Um, but by the time I was in college, there were two things that happened. First of all, um, when my mother had primary biliary cirrhosis and had died and my father remarried a widow with two children about my age and we did not get along. Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up getting uh, shipped off to some Christian boarding schools of which I got kicked out of a couple of them. And my father was just extremely disappointed. He had a vision of me being a academic and a pastor. 
and to be a pastor, you have to have a calling to be a pastor. And that just, uh, you know, um, impatient with people and didn't, you know, and just, uh, it was, it was tough. Sure. Um, but, um, so when, uh, by the time I figured out, uh, you know, that, uh, coffee actually made me a functioning human being and I was able to, uh, get into biology, which I was extremely good at terrible, at everything except for biology. And, um, then, uh, went on and, uh, got my PhD in physiology, which is in mathematical modeling of complex systems and then my MD, and then I went to Duke University and was recruited to the University of Pittsburgh. So my father was very proud of me, but we didn't really, we weren't in the same state at that time. And um, so he would call me on Sunday afternoons to see how, how, how I was. But uh, those times growing up, he was very disappointed with me, thought I was a you know huge discipline problem uh, because I was rebellious, but I was a discipline problem because I didn't understand the instructions. and became, you know, angry and, and better from getting punished all the time and just, you know, working hard at school and failing. Uh, so um, I think he, he was, he was actually shocked that I finished college, was double shocked when I got a PhD, triple shocked with an MD. Then I was accepted at Duke and he's going like, who is this guy? <laughs> so um, then then um, my youngest daughter, when she was in junior high school, had to interview my grandfather about World War II. And so she's interviewing him and he's talking about this stuff. And we're going, who is this guy? We've never heard these stories before. <laughs> we had no idea, you know. And um, so I started documenting this this stuff and, and uh, really I was able to build a relationship working through his diaries because he kept a diary every day of his life mm -hmm. since age 11 so that's 30,000 pages and uh, all the letters he had and was able to uh, really get to know him through uh, writing this this book and um, uh, you know he I was happy that he um, it, it, you know appreciated uh, who I was from um, an accomplishment standpoint other than just you know uh, seeing me as as uh, one of his children, he needed to you know continue to to nurse along. Mm, no, and and it's it's so beautiful the way you, you painted that. Even through all the struggle, you can still see, uh, you know, God working. And you know, what, what you you mentioned dyslexia. My wife is actually dyslexic, and it was through her finding that out, I believe, in her college years that we she found out that her father is as well. So I mean. You know, he, he struggled his entire life with very similar things. I mean, as you were talking, I'm like, oh, I heard I've heard all these stories about the about what you know, what he went through and, and you know, what my wife subsequently went, went through. But it's 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 amazing, too, because I, I believe I believe Tom Cruise has and there's a lot of actors and entrepreneurs that, that have dyslexia. So it doesn't surprise me then about what you're doing now with your company and trying to solve a problem in a very unique and creative way. So, I mean, that's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? God creates each person with strengths and weaknesses for a purpose. Amen. And the one of the great joys I have in life is that I'm really good at solving complex problems that are unsolvable. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I was running the division, I we had a guy from Harvard, an MD, PhD uh, from Harvard with a PhD in neuroscience. And uh, I had him as my clinical associate chief. Um and he came up to me one day and said, David, it's really amazing to watch you solve unsolvable problems sideways. <laughs> I love that. I so love I, I did, you know, I thought that was, that was interesting, but I didn't, I, um, I thought it was logical and straightforward. He, he saw that it was completely different the way everybody else looks at it and actually was able to solve those kinds of problems. So anyway, um, God's given me a uh, uh, a disability that's a great strength and guided me into a position where I believe I've been able to have a, an important impact. And um, so for that, I'm very thankful. But uh, I think that, you know, one of the most important things I've done uh, is to write this biography about my father 
uh, because he's really somebody whose life uh, needs to be studied. It's a story that needs to be told. And there are many examples of how God mo um, molds people and things that he was strongly opposed to or mistakes he made to end up in a place where he wasn't expecting, but it was the hand of God preparing him, you know, to write the Genesis flood and to, uh, to really learn how to defend the Bible in a way that nobody had really defended it before. He, he was really one of the first to use an inductive Bible study method and a presuppositional approach to apologetics, where you say, you start a conversation not by, I believe philosophically there's a God because blah, blah, blah. You say, God wrote a book and he said, and you unleash the, you know, the, the scripture truth and the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way anyone can actually uh, be saved and be a Christian. It's not your, you know, your argument. It's can you present the scripture so the Holy Spirit can change a heart and mind? Hmm. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for sharing your 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 father's life and your life with him and then you know everything that that god has done in your life in particular with your career i i can't thank you enough now it is time for the lightning round this is my favorite segment of the program so five qu five questions quick answers think 20 seconds or less and then we'll, we'll hope i won't be out. shocked by your questions in What's the lightning that? round I hope I won't be shocked by the lightning in your lightning rounds. I don't think you'll be too shocked. I think they're right. pretty straightforward. So let's start. Okay. What's the most rewarding thing about being a parent? Being a grandparent. Mm, interesting. The How about best. the most difficult thing about being a parent? Um, struggling with the teenage years where your children think that you are complete idiots and they know everything. And you can't reason with them. It's just very frustrating. Talk about, uh, you know, talk about being in, in the struggle and uh, relying on faith. <laughs> Number yeah. three, who is one Christian you admire and why? Um, David Jeremiah, other than my father. Um, he's uh, just a man of God who's working hard. He's so clear. And so articulate, and I uh, really appreciate all that he has has done, and and uh, I admire him. Perfect. Number four, best resource on biblical biblical perseverance other than this book. Well, I don't read because <laughs> it's painful. Uh, if I <laughs> oh, that's it. right. Well, that's true. Well, then yeah. let's let's um. Well, let's let's just say research. Okay. So forget people book. from the Bible. Uh, I mean, I tell you, uh, I, I love Daniel mm -hmm. uh, as an example from the Bible uh, who persevered. And the other person is the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. In his, you know, he was saved. Uh, he had been from a background who had persecuted uh, Christians. In his first missionary journey, um, Paul and Barnabas would go into a city. They would take Paul and beat him to a pulp, and they'd. Barnabas would bring him out. They'd go to the next city. They'd pick out Paul and beat Paul up again. And it, yeah. Paul kept getting singled out, and but he persevered and went forward with that. And really, uh, I thought was an, an incredible um, training that God gave him. Um, and he, I mean, he knew that he was the one that's, that was going to that was going to get beaten to uh, you know the, the brink of death. Um, and uh, and yet he persevered. So I thought, uh, you know, uh, those are two examples that that I really appreciate. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then the last one, can you give us a Christian quote or a Bible verse that you're meditating on lately? Um, probably uh, Colossians uh, 3.17, you know, uh, whatever you do in word and deed to do all uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to the glory of God. And uh, that's really important because uh, it's everything you do. Do it in a way that um, from the world's perspective and from a divine perspective advances the kingdom of God uh, in a positive way or a defensive way or uh, in an illustrative way. But uh, your time's not wasted. You're doing things for God's glory. Amen. 
Well, thank you so much. This has been such an enlightening interview. I mean, so many different aspects of it that I think people are really going to find such value in. Uh, now's the time in the show where you tell us where we can connect with you and pick up a copy of Good and Faithful Servant. All right. So um, the uh, Good and Faithful Servant is uh, published by Master Books and masterbooks.com. It's there uh, under theology. So that's a, a place you can find it. It's also available on Amazon, although I think it uh, costs a little bit more uh, on Amazon. So um, that would be the place. I think there's other places that uh, are that also carry it. Um, I have an email that's also available. It's DC Whitcomb, uh, no periods for David Clement Whitcomb at christianworkman.org. So if anybody has a question and wants to reach out, that would be a place to catch me. That's David Whitcomb at christianworkman.org. Perfect. Thank you so much. And guys, I will link all that up in the show notes for you to have easy access to. David, thanks so much for coming on the show. May God grant you many blessed years. Take care and God bless. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to share this time with you. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to Dad Devotionals. Make sure you subscribe to our newsletter at daddevotionals.com slash subscribe. Until then, God bless.